today's episode of the Brain Spike Bat podcast, we speak with Madhav Srinath, CEO and CTO of Nexus Leap, a technology and management consulting firm focused on helping organizations make sense of their data and use it to make critical business decisions. In this episode, you will learn how Nexus Leap first started, the story behind how they came up with the name Nexus Leap and what it means, alongside insights into what the future of cloud and data services holds. I hope you enjoy today's episode. My name is Madhav Srinath. It is really nice to meet you all. Um, Nexus Leap is a consulting company focused on helping organizations, large or small, uh, make sense of their data, uh, bring it in a secure repository, um, and help them use that data to make decisions that are critical for their business and basically for their clients, right? To drive business impact um, through data. That's that's our model here at Nexus Sleep. Awesome. Fantastic. Well, data is something that's come up a lot on the show and there's no doubt that it's going to continue to play a huge role in our lives. So I'm really excited to have this conversation with you. And before we get any further, I really want to know like when and how did Nexus Sleep first start? Yeah. So, so Nexus Sleep started in the middle of the, uh, I guess, starting of the pandemic. Um, we, we started uh, in a res- kind of responding to some of the, the biggest concerns out there in the very beginning of the pandemic around uh, food distribution, because the, the model changed really where uh, people were, were staying at home more and not really going to restaurants. And so food distributors had just a different way of having to distribute food in general. And one of the biggest ones out there reached out to me and we started working on ways to consolidate data and provide the right insights to their internal stakeholders so that they can better solve this problem of food distribution with the pandemic um, kind of changing things around. So it was really interesting, Sam. From there, we've grown from you know delivering value to these large enterprises like distributors that have so many different stakeholders to um, distilling our, our core values and, and our, our really our value proposition itself to be around helping businesses use their data to drive critical decisions. Awesome. Fantastic. Well, I have to say, anytime I hear a story of something positive coming out of the pandemic is fantastic because obviously it was such a crap time for so many people. So (laughs) I I loved hearing about how that was something that like, something so positive that came out of it. I'm I'm glad to hear that. And I have to say, I'm really curious, like what's the story behind the name Nexus Leap? Because to me, it sounds like some sort of like sci-fi film. (laughs) <laughs> that's not a bad place to start. Um, it, it's actually interesting, Sam, when, when we kind of uh, were workshopping for names, it took forever, by the way, uh, we landed on Nexus Sleep um, with a variety of logical constraints like uh, domain availability, right? Um, but also we wanted to make sure that it was, it was something that energized people to break free of what they know and, and kind of take that leap into something they don't quite know, but is what's best for them. So if we think about the energy that's that's kind of part of that word, the leap, um, that, that, was, that was part of it that was very important to me. And the nexus part of it, it it's just, you know, we want to move from one, one congregation of important decisions and data and um, basically the, the state of things as it is. I, I kind of think of that as a nexus. And sometimes we have to make the leap so that we can continue to scale, right? We can continue to grow with the, the new things around us, the new challenges we face, the, the new problems we're now trying to solve. And I think I just wanted the name to be something that gave everybody, our, our, our people that work at Nexus Sleep, but also clients that we, that we serve, um, a, kind of a way to say, let's keep moving. Let's keep moving forward and taking those leaps uh, to build something that allows it to scale as best as it can. Yeah, I think the use of leap there is really strong because for me, it does paint a picture of visualization of like stepping in or jumping into the future. Um, yeah. So I, I, that really shines through to me. And I'd also want to know, like, can you give us some insights into what you think the future of cloud and data services holds and maybe share some emerging trends and disruptive technologies to watch out for? Absolutely, Sam. So what's been really interesting, we've seen um, it's a lot has changed over the last few months. You know, uh, we've seen something as uh, groundbreaking as chat GPT um, become commonplace, which is something that hasn't really happened in AI in the past. Um, and, and artificial intelligence in general is just 
uh, another facet of technology, right? It's, it's, it's under the umbrella of technology and the improvements and innovation in technology. Um, and if we think about cloud computing, really, it's the ability for us to um, kind of build just what we need and pay for exactly that without having to take on a lot of overhead, right? We don't have to take on servers. We don't have to build data centers or provision them and uh, put in you know, long-term commitments for that. We're able to just take what's out there, just that little bit of it and experiment on it and then grow only if it's necessary. So if we think about cloud computing, I always like to think about the other advancements in technology like AI that's out there as well. We'll build on the AI side of things, but from a cloud computing standpoint, I think what we're gonna see more and more is these cloud providers are actually going to start implementing or at least having additional services within their own platforms that allow easy integration of these cloud technologies uh, with the AI technologies that are getting better and better as well. So we're gonna see more and more of cloud platform providers partnering with AI tech providers to create this experience for users of either or both of those kinds of technologies uh, to build products that really drive huge impact to their customers. Cool. Yeah, that'd be really cool to see what comes from that. And it's so funny that you mentioned chat GPT, because I swear in the past six months or so, that topic, <laughs> or the, it's come up in every episode uh, almost. I mean, maybe I'm over-exaggerating a bit, but it certainly feels that way. So it's, um, it's really cool. It, um, and I also understand that you, you do a lot of analytics work in the cloud. Like, How do you differentiate your approach when working with large enterprises versus startups, for example? Absolutely. That's a good question, Sam. Well, one thing we find with large enterprises, it's, um, it's a factor of time and adoption of technology when they started the company. That's usually what ends up coming into play here. Uh, large enterprises usually, you know, they, they didn't become large overnight. They, they became large over a long period of time. And so they have investments that they've made when they first started their businesses as they've grown their businesses. And these technological investments they've made have led them to kind of take on some legacy software that they are continually working on integrating with other software, some of which may also be legacy, but a lot of it are, are new and, and kind of upcoming. And so when we work with large enterprises, a lot of the work involves integrating these many different components together and having a longer term view. There's, there's a strategy in place that we go in and kind of work with these enterprise leaders to put in place. And, and the work we end up doing is, is so much more around intelligence to every facet of the business, right? So we have the strategy in place, but how can we help every facet of this large enterprise? How can we help sales? How can we help marketing? How can we help category management if that, that applies to that company? Uh, how can we help finance? And now each of these components of the business have different ways to use data to do what they need to do for that function. Um, and large enterprises just tend to have more facets that, are, that have separate decisions that need to be made, but also still need to look at the same data. It's clear that you do really take a very analytical approach to this. Um... I'm very kind of methodical in, in the way you just described there. And I know that you've also already spoken a little bit about like the advancements of AI and with AI competition heating up so much, what advice do you have for companies wanting to utilize AI as part of their product or process? And how does that change when considering startups versus enterprises? Definitely, definitely, Sam. So um, we talked about large enterprises having all these different functions and all these uh, each of these functions driving impact in different ways, uh, ideally with similar data sets, but maybe different parts of similar data sets. Um, small companies, what ends up happening is so many people wear different hats and um, the, the, the data set is growing with the company. Uh, and they also start off being uh, a lot more, um, they, they start off with the best technologies, right? They start off with the, the latest CRM out there. They start off using the latest cloud platforms so it, it becomes less of a question of migrating legacy software and more of a question of what different, what, what patchwork of technology makes sense right now to put together so that we can solve the problems with, you know, the best effectiveness and speed as possible. Now, if we, you know, with that differentiation in place, um, small companies, when, when they try to adopt something like artificial intelligence, um, this depends a lot on the company itself and the problem they're trying to solve, but I, I always recommend that we never make the AI 
a core component of their product unless they're willing to bet everything on that. Um, usually what ends up happening is it's a technology product that, that is very useful. Uh, it's easy to use for their customers. It has a lot of different features. And maybe AI can be one of those many features. That ends up being very useful to companies. And from an implementation perspective, uh, you always want to think about the way the competitive landscape that you're in as your company and your competitors and the competitive landscape that AI companies are in with their AI competitors. And if you want to make the most of it, um, you, you kind of want to make sure that AI companies can innovate on their, their proprietary algorithms and you have what you need to integrate with the latest and greatest they come out with. And usually what ends up happening, Sam, is that that differentiating factor that you end up having is the data set that you carefully curate uh, from when you start your product and start accumulating data to when you realize that using AI is a good part of this, you know, it's a good next step here. And therefore you have, you have this differentiating factor and you have the latest tech. And when you combine these two in a very modular fashion, you're never really having to make AI a core component of what you do. You can always just take advantage of the latest and greatest out there knowing that your differentiating factor is the data that you've compiled and curated. Fantastic. Well, it sounds like you have like so much knowledge to share in this space. I'm sure we could go on and on about this, but I really do want to take a step away from like next sleep. And for my final question, I'll ask you on a completely separate note, um, something that struck me about you, which I find so interesting because I love animals and I know you do too. As I saw on your LinkedIn, that you said, my wife and I share a 10-year goal to be, a finan to be in a financial position to purchase large plots of land and build infrastructure to rescue as many animals as possible. In addition, we want to facilitate better human-animal connections using technology. But to be quite honest, outside of ideas like Uber for dog training, we have no idea what that might look like yet. This is so fantastic, and I love taking a step back and speaking with people personally to understand how they operate outside of their role as well and this is a fantastic example of this like when was this plan established and do you have any updates on how it's going i'm so glad you uh, looked into that side of things sam um i think one thing that's no secret is uh, my wife and i absolutely love animals uh if we could we'd have far more than we do now currently we have two wonderful dogs uh, named simba and nala uh, we love lion king as well so you know different motivations and inspirations um, that, that plan we've had, it's, it's one of those things where um, we, we have never been in a situation where we're, we're kind of going after dollars for the sake of getting more dollars. Um, and, and that's interesting because it's maybe something that a lot of people want to say. And it's a lot of, a lot of people with the philanthropic mindset also would say that. Um, the reason that we say that is really because that's how we find ourselves being happy is uh, really taking care of our dogs, our family in that way. Uh, they're very much are our family at this point, and they always will be. Um, and if we think about this goal, if we're like, listen, you know, we, we want to build this business. Uh, and by the way, my wife and I work together at Nexus Sleep. Uh, that's one of the main reasons we're, we're so into this as a family. We're all into this company and this, this conviction of being able to build better uh, surrounding infrastructure and tools for data decision making. Um, we're both in this together and we have this shared goal of maybe, maybe getting into ventures that are not, you know, profitable per se. We're not going after it to make a profitable venture. Uh, we're just going after it because it's something that is really going to add impact in a different way that we um, really resonate with. So for us, if we think about, you know, we have two dogs. Um, what if we had 200? I mean, couldn't fit in our house, right? It couldn't fit in um, uh, <laughs> I don't know, probably not, uh, maybe one day, but uh, really what, what ends up happening is it's, it's really not about us then. It's not about us and our 200 dogs. It's about the impact we can have with animals at large, you know? And um, I think that's where we as human beings can, can put ourselves in positions where we, where we get this abstract thing called money and we can use that to then buy other things that we want. And then we just kind of go in the cycle and, um, uh, you know, animals can't do that. They can't, you know, create money for themselves, but we have so much love and respect for, for animals. And we want to put, we want to be in a position to uh, kind of advocate for them. Um, maybe not in a animal rights perspective, but just in a way where we can create a, 
um, a nice environment for them to be in um, and, and kind of help not only animals uh, have a nice environment they're in where they're uh, sheltered, they're fed, they're taken care of. But, but the part of that I find really interesting is even if we do all that, that's still very much dependent on us. Um, the part that I think will really make this something that will help everybody is if we foster that human animal connection, Sam. And that's where things like, you know, a bad dog can become a great dog if it has the right training, you know, and just, just with that, with that mentality in mind, how, how can we do things where human beings that maybe don't know how to train dogs, but, um, and don't know how to deal with bad dogs or, uh, how to raise dogs, or if they're in a position where, you know, they're not doing so well, they don't have the support to make things happen and, and even, you know, lead a life that they want to lead. Uh, we want to find some kind of way of being like, well, let's, let's foster connection between dogs and, 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 and people. Right. And I, and I say dogs because they're the closest animal to us, but just in general animals and people and, and put it in a way where, you know, we, we can actually help other people help dogs. And therefore the, the, the kind of the livelihood of animals isn't just us, right? It's not just us being in a financial position to do it, but, but rather kind of just make that more exponential, give that ability to other people and therefore, you know, help even more animals. And, in, and at some point in time, I think if we find ourselves saying, this is going to be something we're really proud of. It would be that it's, it's kind of creating that. Mm -hmm. I completely understand where you're coming from. I mean, I love animals myself. I, I have, a cat i've grown up with cats dogs birds rats all sorts and cool. um i yeah i love animals as well so i think that's such a fantastic mission that you're on and if people do want to keep up with the work you folks are doing at next to sleep or potentially the work you and your wife are doing to obviously improve and foster a stronger connection between humans and animals where are the best places they can keep up with you sam the best place right now i'm not a big social media guy the one thing i'm on mostly is linkedin at this point in time um, email is actually a great way as well. I, I look at every email that comes my way, but I'll give you both. But LinkedIn is where, um, you know, we're, we're really, we're trying to say, we're trying to provide a lot of value to people um, outside of an engagement with Nexus Sleep. We just, we just want to have, I just want to have a way to kind of express to people how they can kind of take this low hanging fruit and put themselves in better positions to take advantage of the technology, just exponentially, um, innovating around us. And uh, I, I think if we on LinkedIn, I'll give you the link, Sam, but that's the best way to follow and connect with me. I read all my messages. I'm always very open to a quick phone call and introduction with anybody. Um, and um, that's probably the best way. LinkedIn is the best way and then email as well. Sam. Fantastic. Well, we'll have a link to your LinkedIn in the show notes, but otherwise I just want to say thank you so much for joining me today. And yeah, all of the best of work on uh, both of your missions really at Nexus Sleep and also outside of Nexus Sleep. Growing a company has many hurdles, from securing funding to expanding your business capabilities to ranking better on search. Each business challenge is uniquely complex. The solution to these challenges is growth-focused digital PR and marketing, and that is where our sponsor, Publicize, comes in. Publicize sets itself apart from traditional PR companies. It does not charge large retainers or churns out press releases whether you've got a newsworthy announcement or not. Publicize builds businesses' online presence and gets high-quality PR and media coverage for startups and entrepreneurs who are priced out of a broken PR industry. What's more, listeners of Brainspike Back can find the tools and resources they need to overcome common hurdles that many startups face when trying to generate long-term growth by visiting publicize.co slash bbb. That's publicize.co slash bbb. That is it for today's episode. Thank you for joining us. I hope you've learned something. And if you have benefited from today's episode, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcast as these reviews really help us grow the show. You can also follow us wherever you get your podcasts, including YouTube. Just search Brain Spike back and you will find us. We hope you join us for more episodes in the future. And until then, take care. Disclosure, this episode contained a client and a Spacio portfolio company.